Welcome. Um, we need to start because there has a lot of material and a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> this is the Western Mass Associate, the Western Mass Young Association, and you can go to our website at westmassyoung.org. And I'll go through the drill if you haven't been here before. We don't take a break. If you need the bathroom, it's right out the door there. And I want to I want to thank Smith College for uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to use this wonderful space. It's um, quite a privilege to be here. So we, um, if you want to join our email list, I think Dan has made it very easy to go to the website and get your name on the web on the email list. And we appreciate your donations because that's how we bring people here and keep this going. And um, we had two wonderful little successes this fall that we haven't done before. One was a, a, a wonderful group, book group sort of, right? Sort of book group, <laughs> on uh, Jung's Autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, where we read the book, but then we talked about how it connected with our lives. So hopefully we'll have something like that in the spring. And then Thayer did a wonderful introduction to Saturday's introduction to Jung seminar. So we're hoping to continue doing some extra stuff in the, in the spring. So we'll keep you posted. Okay, so next on January 10th, which is the second Saturday, the second Friday of the month, Richard Trousdale, a local analyst, is giving a talk on death, necessity, <coughs> at the threshold of a new life. And I also want to add, thank Carol Beauvais for bringing our local community TV station here tonight to film this. So this is a first for us. And, um, and also for asking some veterans, getting in touch with some veterans. How many veterans are in the, in the audience? Okay, great. We hope you can add to the discussion. I'm sure there will want you to. How many people have fathers who are veterans? <laughs> Who didn't know? Okay, all right. Um, okay, and are we having a Okay. After this, there will be a salon, and Carol will tell us a little bit more about that. Um, okay, so Thayer Green, Jungian analyst, psychotherapist. I like that look you give me. It's like this. <laughs> Um, I, he wanted to give me to give a very brief uh, thing. So what I appreciate about there is his deep commitment and personal understanding of this work. That uh, he hasn't only studied it and done it clinically, but he really has lived it as a process. And that's where he always speaks from. So, and he's a great storyteller, right, which I'm sure you'll hear a lot of stories tonight. So let's welcome Thayer Green. Thank you, Erica, for being short and also saying nice things about me. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, this um, talk is not a talk about the psychology of war or the mythology of war, although I will refer to that. Uh, it's, it's not a theoretical discussion of how could we possibly eliminate war. Um, it's not going to deal with any of those things, basically. It is an attempt to provide you with an existential, experiential, embodied, imaginative experience of what it feels like and what the experience of being in combat, of being under fire, of how that affects you, of uh, you know, all of the dimensions of uh, the combat soldiers daily experience. Uh, that's what I'm going to try to convey. And uh, I, I want to 
remind you that for every year of peace in the known world, there have been 14 years of war. And this goes back to at least 1500 BC. There have been 8,000 peace treaties in that period of time that have been recorded. Their average duration is two years. So that gives you the background, in a way, to what we are addressing, that war is definitely an archetype, as Jung would describe it. Uh, it is almost entirely universal, except perhaps for some small tribes that have been insulated and have not had to um, interact with uh, the rest of the world. And there are very few of those in our time. And um, so uh, given that brief introduction, what we're first going to do is watch about 10 minutes of that scene in Saving Private Ryan, where these American soldiers are in the assault boats going toward the beach, Omaha Beach, and then jumping off into a total other reality. I mean, you want to see a transition from the personal, familial, relational world, the normal world, into an archetypal level of terror, chaos, horror, and yet having to go forward. Uh, that's what a combat soldier experiences. And uh, so in order to help make this existentially real for you, um, we've set up about 10 minutes of, of that scene. You'll see them in the boats just before they land and then uh, what happens when they land. That is an extreme uh, experience, even in combat warfare, obviously. But it is considered by most uh, military that have been through intense combat to be the most graphic and realistic um, portrayal of the level of chaos of confusion, disorder. You could see how difficult it was to just maintain any kind of structure and, and uh, strategy in terms of that intense uh, fighting. That kind of fighting went on in the hedgerows of Normandy. It went on uh, in the Hurtgen Forest. I think that was almost equally bad. It went on in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, those all were incredibly uh, destructive uh, experiences with many, many uh, casualties. Um, and uh, so that's where we start. Now, my experience, um, I was drafted into the Army in September 1944. That's about three months after D-Day. And I might remind you also that part of why we set this talk at this time is tomorrow is Pearl Harbor Day. And uh, those of you old enough can probably remember where you were when you heard uh, President Roosevelt giving his famous speech to the nation 
you know, that he said, this day shall live in infamy. I can remember exactly where I was. It's like when Kennedy was shot, we remember where we were. Um, I was 18 years old. I was a minister's son, grew up in a preacher's family, uh, which doesn't know this or even how to deal with this, really. Um, um, in that time, we were drafted. We were citizen soldiers who involuntarily, to some degree, uh, were thrown into this conflict. In today's army, um, it's volunteers. Nobody is being drafted. I think that makes some significant difference psychologically, but I'm not really prepared to know how it distinguishes it. Um, when I had my interview as to where I might serve uh, our great country, I had a board corporal interviewing me, and I had had a very good um, high school education at Phillips Exeter Academy, and I had crammed two years of German into my senior year when I realized I probably was going to end up in the war and hoped I'd be uh, in the Atlantic Theater. So, and my goal was to somehow serve in military government and in some way um, be involved in a peace process um, as the war came to a conclusion. Well, this board corporal, by the time I was drafted, infantry casualties were enormous. Fourteen percent of the military were foot infantry, and they suffered between 70 and 85 percent of all casualties. Um, so this board corporal interviewed me, and I explained all this uh, persuasively, I thought, and he said, you got flat feet, bud? And I said, no. Infantry. So that was my vocational interview in the military. Um, and I do think that perhaps the voluntary nature of people going into the service now uh, and serving in Iraq and Afghanistan may make some difference, but not very much, because they're facing something uh, of the nature of what you saw on the screen. Um, and so I went into uh, basic training in Camp Cross, South Carolina. And um, those of you who have served in the military uh, and have gone through basic training, especially basic infantry training, uh, have some uh, empathic understanding of what it's like. It's very physical to start with. Um, you, uh, um, you know, you march out to the uh, target range, and that's a good 10-mile hike in the morning. After breakfast, you've already stood uh, um, uh, for inspection at about 5.30 or 6, and uh, uh, then you put on your pack and pick up your rifle and all of that after breakfast. And, stand in order and march off, you spend the day um, shooting at uh, targets with various weapons. In the course of my training, I uh, was uh, educated in seven or eight different ways to kill another human being. Um, and uh, to give you some idea of how physical it was, one of the training experiences is you have to crawl 
through an under barbed wire with actual machine gun fire 30 inches above you. So you better not freak out and stand up because you'll be dead. So that's part of just teaching you how to uh, uh, preserve your own existence. And uh, there, you know, we get in what they call, I can't remember what it was called, the tiger pit. There'd be a drill instructor standing in the center and then in a circle, in an indented circle, they'd have you crawling, they'd have you jumping, they'd have you doing somersaults. And, you know, I was 18 and I'd been a high school athlete, but we had men in their 30s. Uh, you know, it was one wonderful guy who uh, uh, came from Brooklyn and he was in the garment business and he had three kids and he was overweight. And he had to really struggle, I remember. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, they had you do, which I just, so many of us had a hard time with it, but uh, you put you put a, the bayonet on your rifle and then they had dummies and you ran toward them and screamed, kill, 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 and stabbed them uh, with uh, your bayonet. And, uh, you know, if you didn't do this convincingly, obviously you had to do it again. Um, kind of psychodrama, you might say. Um, but uh, it, it was uh, um, rigorous, to put it kindly. And, uh, um, you know, I think I probably survived it as well as anyone. Um, I was 18 and pretty strong and uh, physically fit. Uh, but the thing that is so much a part of basic training, and I, I think the Marines probably do this to an extreme uh, level, um, a Yugian psychiatrist analyst out on the West Coast writes, there is a natural resistance to killing other human beings. Uh, and then he writes, we have to train people to kill other people. The rituals of boot camp with its intensive social pressures, uniforms, facial paint, transform ordinary young people into killers by turning them into automatons who are not allowed individuality. Uh, I would say that's a pretty good description. There's not an opportunity to have much of an experience of individuality in military service. And uh, uh, basic training is where if you bring individuality, they try to uh, extinguish it. Now, one of the things that is really very important in the capacity to kill other human beings is written at some length by a number of people, but the term I use is subspeciation. In other words, you are not killing another human being. You're killing an animal. You're killing a, a, a rapist. You're killing a monster. You're killing, uh, uh, you know, there's strong racial elements in it, anti-Semitic elements in it, in the Nazi propaganda, uh, on and on. It, but you have to reduce the other to less than human in order to destroy that other human being. And, and we call the Germans Krauts. Uh, in Vietnam, the Vietnamese were Gooks. Um, I think in the First World War they were Heinies. Um, I can't, uh, I don't know what it was in Japan, I mean Japs, but it, they had something more degrading than that. 
Uh, and this is a part of your training and a part of your psychology when you are, I mean, think of the Germans and behind those machine guns and what their psychology had to be uh, in terms of loyalty to the Fuhrer and the fatherland destroying these invaders. Uh, it is so fundamentally a part of uh, the combat experience. Um, one of the other things that, again, this has to do with the physical training and then the physical experience that I had and that everybody else did, of what was worn and carried on a daily basis when you're fighting. You've got boots that usually were not waterproof, so your feet got wet, two pairs of socks, winter underwear, um, layers of pants, shirts, jackets, uh, wool knit cap, gloves, a steel helmet, a belt with a first aid kit, a shovel, a canteen, a bayonet, and ammunition clips. Um, and then we had, in order to have more ammunition, you had two bandoliers of uh, ammunition uh, slung around your, your uh, shoulders. Um, and then K rations, delicious, and a rifle. And then the machine gun team, which was usually two or three guys, had to carry two parts to the machine gun and lots of machine gun ammo. And the mortar uh, team had to carry the mortar and the, the base for the mortar. And then another guy had to carry a lot of mortar shells and hoped he never, they never got hit by a bullet. Um, and on and on. Um, I ended up being the platoon radio man, and so I had a 40-pound radio in my back in addition to all of this. Uh, so I was carrying probably 70 pounds uh, every day when I got up, and you got up early. And uh, so that that's a part of the experience that uh, forms your survival training. Um, now, I was an infantry replacement, and so I was shipped overseas in uh, early January after they shortened our training by four weeks because the Battle of the Bulge took so many casualties. Uh, and I remember being on a troop ship that had 7,500 troops on it, and I didn't know a single person. <coughs> and there was this experience that infantry replacements, as over against when units went over as a unit and had trained for a year together and knew each other and there was a bond, the terrible loneliness of going out into an ocean infested by submarines <coughs> And we were attacked by submarines, but we didn't get hit. Um, and um, the um, uh, the sense of going off into such an incredible unknown, which, as you saw the clip here, this transition from the everyday, the normal, even in the army, the everyday, the normal. And then they're there at the edge of archetypal, incredible um, horror and still having to go forward. Uh, and that leaves a mark on human beings that they never fully escape. Now, I want to, I'm going to, we're going to turn off the lights and Dan is going to show you just a few
images from this very interesting book by Sam Keane, Faces of the Enemy, Reflections of the Hostile Imagination, The Psychology of Enmity. And um, I'm going to have you see, this is collective projection of the shadow, a collective dark, dark shadow onto other cultures, other nations, other troops, other people. But it, it, it's quite revealing. Okay, Dan. <coughs> you can see in this one here, Japanese portrayal, that's obviously German. Um, okay, next. Uh, English, English pigs. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you get the point. This is subspeciation going on. Uh, World War One, World War Two, etc. Okay, Dan. Okay, here we have here we have rape, uh, violence of various kinds, particularly in relation to the feminine here, protecting our our uh, our women against uh, the enemy. Okay. Here, you know, uh, it sort of speaks for itself. Uh, we're down to the marine and insect level of uh, description, and uh, this, you know, was done by uh, all these different nations. That Okay, then. Uh, it shows you of collective projection and uh, as a necessary element in allowing us to destroy other people, other cultures, etc. And it's universal. We, we don't escape here, obviously. Now, when I was riding in a troop truck with about 10 other replacements, and there were two uh, combat veterans, they'd been in it since at least uh, uh, July, they, they weren't in D-Day, but, and they were coming back from the hospital, they'd both been wounded, and now they were coming back to rejoin uh, their unit. And we were approaching the front, and the first thing you hear are the roar of the 155 millimeter howitzers, who can send that can send a shell 15 miles, um, and it's they're enormous explosions when they land. And those were our American howitzers, obviously. And you know, many of the Adolescents like me, I, I wasn't exactly making jokes at that point, but their, I think their anxiety had them, you know, uh, somehow 
trying to joke and to uh, act up a bit. The shells brought a certain silence, but uh, then as we moved past the, the uh, firing of the howitzers, what we saw, it was, you know, there was a covered truck with canvas, but we could look out the back. And pretty soon, we saw American corpses lined up in rows on the side of the road waiting for the grave detail. And um, it was deadly silence in a deadly vision. And one of the two veterans said, now boys, you know this is for real. And that's part of what I'm trying to capture tonight. I get so upset when I see all the advertisements for destructive TV and fit and films and everybody gets blown up and none of it is real. And what you just saw in its portrayal, but it's as realistic portrayal as you could find. Um, so, then my first, the day after uh, I joined, I got in late in the afternoon or evening and the fighting sort of stopped. I was in the 3rd Armored Division, um, 36 Armored Infantry, Company C, uh, Platoon C. And uh, that's where I was assigned. And uh, the, the, the second lieutenant uh, greeted me and the sergeant greeted me. And, uh, you know, I was given a friendly welcome. Uh, I think the veteran fighters are always a little leery of these rookies because we don't know the hell how to fight. We haven't been there. And um, so then the next day, they actually took those of us who had just joined and said, we're going to introduce you very carefully to this experience, which I thought was really smart. So they took us, uh, we were on the outskirts of Cologne at that point, Cologne, Germany. And uh, what I remember is, you know, walking around and then um, apparently we got in sight of uh, German 88 guns, which was one of their best guns. It was an anti-tank gun, but also anti-personnel. And all of a sudden, whew, 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 wham, 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 uh, just about 10, 15 yards in front of us. And we all hit the ground immediately and crawled back. And the sergeant who was taking us around said, well, that's an introduction. And uh, um, the thing that is so curious for me is um, uh, you know, this transition from the normal and familiar to the shocking new archetypal reality. And, you know, what I realized was, these people are trying to kill me and they don't even know me. You know, that's the feeling. It's very different, I think, than hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat back in the times of Rome or even the, uh, the periods of knighthood. Um, it's a very impersonal death, a very impersonal killing that you do. Uh, and it is kill or be killed. Uh, that's kind of the basic formula that uh, you're dealing with. And uh, it, uh, it's not very romantic. Uh, it's uh, not very meaningful in many ways. And, you know, the, the bombers at 30,000 feet, that's totally impersonal. 
Now we've got the drones. Somebody in Florida can knock out somebody in Afghanistan or in, uh, uh, where am I thinking? Pakistan. Yeah, Pakistan. So what that raises then is dealing with fear and terror and shame. You know, can I take this? Everything in you wants to turn and run. I don't want to be here. And uh, so um, I, you know, I was, put it in the military vernacular, I was scared shitless. And so was everybody else. And, but we had a, a day or two at a certain point before we jumped off in a major attack where it was early spring, but it was a nice warm day. And, um, our artillery was down below us on another hillside, and, and uh, we had time to sleep and eat and relax. And I went up to one of the combat veterans who'd been there for months. And I said, uh, do you get over being scared? And he looked at me. He was probably about 26 or 27. <laughs> he said, Sonny, I'm more scared now than I was when I came. And I sure as hell am more scared than you are, because you don't know yet how scared you're going to be. I thought that was a wonderful uh, statement. <clears throat> and so that's where in, our, in the Second World War, it was described as combat fatigue. In the First World War, it was described as shell shock. And then, uh, I guess by Vietnam anyway, and certainly now, it's described as PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, and my exposure to combat was much less intense, really, than uh, men who'd been in much longer and had to fight much more difficult battles. And there was nothing at all heroic about me. I just tried to do my job. Um, and um, there was one experience among many where I was pinned down by artillery fire. Our platoon was in the woods pinned down by artillery fire. The German observer had some access to where we were because when we moved, the shells followed us, and they were exploding all around us. Guys were screaming and dying, and uh, I was curled up in a fetal ball um, behind a tree, absolutely immobilized. And uh, a guy who had just joined our outfit the night before from the Iowa cornfields, had gotten hit in his groin by shrapnel and was dying about probably 20 yards away or less. I couldn't move. Fortunately, one of uh, my buddies was a little closer and he crawled over and held him while he died. And um, that was the most traumatic moment, I think, that I had. And when I got home, I could remember it, but I didn't feel it. Uh, and I went through years of Jungian analytic training, and it never came up, the feeling. I had cognitive memory. It was 32 years later, out in Esalen, on the west coast of the Esalen Institute, 
I was in a uh, uh, therapy group with a Gestalt therapist who was very gifted, and he was also Buddhist trained, and he focused on the breath. And I was in this therapy group of about 15 of us, and I started having dreams of earthquakes and tidal uh, waves and volcanoes, and I was in this idyllic setting, and I was experiencing nothing but fear and terror. And so after two or three days of this, I said, it's time for me to sit on the hot seat. And so I sat on the hot seat, and this man led me back into that experience and had me describing it until I was reliving it finally at an emotional level. I was screaming and yelling and crying and begging forgiveness of this dying a young soldier that I couldn't go to and feeling all of the shame and horror of it. And uh, as you can see, it still affects me. But I was released. I was, when I left that week, you know, I felt like I was walking on air. Anita hardly recognized me <coughs> for a while. Um, so, um, I would, I would, had PTSD at some fundamental unconscious level, and finally it surfaced for some reason at that time, partly because I wasn't being the therapist. I wasn't in charge. I was just me in a situation where I could let it hang out. And boy, did it want to hang out. And one of the things in the recovery of soldiers with PTSD is more and more they're realizing you have to get them to their affect. They really have to relive it in order to get through it. Uh, you can take pills, but until you relive it, uh, you're not going to be uh, liberated from it. Um, I also, um, one of the writers I've read about this said that uh, uh, that in the veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, we have created 500,000 mentally wounded Americans. And I think that's probably true. I also, after the war, I, I ripped my thigh open. I won't go, no point going into the details, but I was in a military hospital in Stuttgart for about three months. And the guy next to me in the next bed, half of his body had been burned. Uh, I can't remember whether it was in the war or afterward. But on a daily basis, you know, we had to see his bandages changed and his agony. And uh, this, you know, has been repeated all over uh, with wounded disabled veterans coming back in every land. Um, now, what happens when you're in a platoon and in a, a, a squad um, is there's a radical change in your values. Um, you know, I grew up, as I said, in a minister's family. I grew up in privilege. I had private education. Um, I uh, had a strong sense of values. When you are fighting, that doesn't count. What counts is who's the guy next to you? Who's in your squad? What's your connection with them? You are buddies in combat and in mutual survival, bonding, and dependence. And uh, 
you know, I was exposed in a wonderful way to, we had a Kentucky hillbilly in our squad. Uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, Jews from Brooklyn, and I hadn't had too much exposure at that point. Uh, this was not an integration of African Americans yet. This is the Second World War. Uh, now that would be a natural part of it. Um, and um, you're not fighting for God and country and mama's apple pie. You're fighting to survive for another night. That's what you're fighting for. And um, there's very little idealism in a foxhole. One of the things that changed that for me and the other soldiers with me was when our division went we captured the town of Nordhausen. And in Nordhausen, there was a major labor camp. Because Nordhausen is where they built the V-2 rockets that they sent over to bomb London. And the factory was built in a mountain, so it couldn't be bombed. But the labor camp was at the mouth of the entrance to the mountain. So if the Allies bombed, all they did was kill concentration camp prisoners. And they had from all kinds of concentration camp prisoners. And uh, I happened to be one of the lead scouts that day out in front of the tanks and the rest of the infantry. And we were kind of the shooting pigeons. You, vo you rotated. And you just hoped you weren't going to have a machine gun open up. And fortunately, the German <laughs> troops had all left Nordhaus. So I got to a nice, safe stone house on the edge of town, and I looked around the corner, and I saw this strange figure coming at me in a weird uniform. It was white with stripes. And I raised my rifle and kept looking. I realized he wasn't armed, so I dropped my uh, gun down. and. He staggered up to me, and as he got closer, I could see he was a living, walking skeleton. And he fell on his knees uh, and kissed my feet and said, Freiheit, 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 freedom, freedom, freedom. That changed my life. Um, and um, when we got to the camp, there were lots of corpses stacked, but there were also all these people still alive, but scarecrows, and uh, dying of hunger and malnutrition and brutality. Our impulse was to grab our K rations and feed them. Fortunately, the medics were there with us, and they said, Guys, you feed them, you kill them. They can't handle regular food. We will make a nourishing broth and start them back. Uh, and that night, I wrote home to my family, to my parents. I know why I have to be here. I have seen something worse than war. And a lot of other uh, my fellow soldiers had the same reaction. Uh, we weren't just fighting battles for the British and the French. We were fighting for the liberation of these incredibly tortured human beings. Um, One of the things that all of this experience that I've described so far um, has provided me with for the rest of my life is kind of a sense of grace and purpose in having survived. Nothing seems as overwhelming and horrible in contrast with combat experience. <clears throat> 
it's provided a sense of perspective. You know, like everybody else, I have my bad days and my crises. And then I ask myself, Thayer, this ain't so bad. You're breathing. You're, you're married. You got good food. You got a, a roof over your head. You're not in a stinking wet foxhole ducking machine gun bullets. Uh, so what are you complaining about? It does give a sense of perspective on uh, the everyday tribulations that we all have. Um, there was a recent article in the Hampshire Gazette on Veterans Day, um, an interview with a World War II veteran who helped to arrange reunions of his fellow veterans who had been through the war with him in his unit. And uh, he made the comment that so few remain and so few can travel to a reunion. So he was asked by the newspaper interviewer, so why do you persist in trying to have a reunion? And he said, it is a matter of camaraderie. We spent basically a year together or more through hell and high water. We became a bond, a band of brothers. We can relate to each other in ways we can't relate to anyone else. You were not there. These guys were there. They know the horrors we went through. And, um, you know, I, my own experience, I haven't banded with a lot of my uh, brothers uh, in combat, really, uh, except in memory, and uh, with some gratitude and affection. Uh, but that sense that we've been through something that others haven't known. We were there. Um, I think anybody who fought in the infantry, if you ask them, what's the proudest thing you wear on your uniform? It's the combat infantry badge. That designates that you have been in combat. And only those who have been in combat can wear that. And that's I think um, <clears throat> the, the single most important symbol for uh, many combat veterans. Now, Sebastian Junger, who um, uh, he's written a book here. Uh, entitled War, and this is about war in uh, Afghanistan. Um, he, he had an, inter an interview in Newsweek along with two or three other uh, combat veterans, and <clears throat> he wrote something. Um, he, was, he was embedded with, he's a journalist, and he was embedded with a company in Afghanistan for six months. And this is what he says. First he talks about how there was a firefight and they caught a uh, um, uh, enemy, forgotten what kind of enemy at the moment, Taliban I think they were fighting, uh, out in the open and they opened up with uh, machine guns and everything. And watched him get torn apart. And they cheered. And he says, the cheering comes from knowing that's someone who will never have, we will never have to fight again. Fighting another human being is not as hard as you think when they are trying to kill you. People think we were cheering because we just shot someone. This is a soldier talking. But we were cheering because 
we just stop someone from killing us. Kill or be killed. And that's really basic. And then he writes something else which people don't actually understand. War is a lot of things and it is useless to pretend that exciting isn't one of them. It's insanely exciting. War is supposed to feel bad because undeniably bad things happen in it. But for a 19-year-old at the working end of a 50 caliber machine gun during a firefight that everyone comes out of okay, war is life multiplied by some number no one has ever heard of. In 20 minutes of combat is more life than you could scrape together in a lifetime of doing something else. Combat isn't where you might die, though that does happen. It's where you find out whether you get to keep on living. Don't understand, don't underestimate the power of that revelation. I think that's right on target. Uh, at the end of a day of fighting, especially if we had, had captured some German village and pushed the uh, Germans out into the country so they were going to have to sleep in foxholes and get wet and we were going to be in farmhouses and uh, um, have beds to sleep in and we'd always go down in the cellar and dig in the coal pile and almost inevitably you would find brandy and wine and schnapps and so uh, we'd bring all that up and we'd get roaring drunk and cook our K rations. Uh, once in a while we got what was called C rations, which was supposed to be an upgrade from K rations, which is dubious. Uh, and um, the amount of adrenaline we were releasing from that day's fighting was just, just unbelievable. We would laugh. We had, you know, black humor. Uh, uh, and there's so much. I, uh, a lot of it I don't even remember, but I couldn't repeat it if I if I could remember. Uh, and um, so I share that with you. Uh, <clears throat> I had to go out and stay in guard duty on the uh, west bank of the Rhine and the uh, Germans were on the east bank of the Rhine. And <clears throat> two things about that experience. One was I had to find my way through a level of rubble that you wouldn't believe. Cologne was 90% destroyed. Uh, there were a couple of holes in the top of the ceiling of the cathedral, but they tried to avoid destroying it. And <clears throat> you went very carefully because they had snipers on the other side of the river, so you always wanted to have some kind of protection. The other thing <clears throat> that was uh, kind of a, a crap game um, was the, <clears throat> we were stationed in an underground bunker which was right next to the Cologne Cathedral. And it took, God, I don't know how many troops, two or three companies, I think, and some vehicles underground, nine feet of reinforced concrete and steel. But there was an entrance, and then there was an area about the size of this room that was uh, open, kind of uh, piazza. And uh, the Germans were zeroed in on that. And so they dropped mortars in that place. And so when you had to do guard duty, you had to get out across that. And uh, the Germans used irregular timing with the mortars so that you could never predict 
So that was one of the crapshoots that just on an everyday level we had to deal with. And uh, uh, I really think some, some of us could have qualified for the Olympics in the way we got across that, that area. <clears throat> that, was, that was one uh, um, experience. Um, the point I want to make here about American psychology is since the Civil War has ended in 1865, we have not had an actual war and sustained destruction on our territory. 9-11 is the only exception. And it is really horrible, but small by comparison. We lost three or 4,000 civilians, uh, killed or injured. In the Civil War, two million American uh, Civil War soldiers on both sides died. And the South was severely damaged and violated by Union forces. Sherman's march through Georgia, for example. And so, it's not part of our memory. It is still part of the South's memory. And that's why the South has a different collective psychology still, to some extent. And um, um, my uh, um, let me read some more on this issue. This is from uh, a book, The Boys' Crusade by Paul Fussell, is a famous war author. He's written several good books about the war. This was about guys like me, 18, 19 year olds, sent over in large amounts as infantry replacements. But he has a lot of interesting uh, information. And he said, he writes, in 1942, Eisenhower was trying to uh, talk official Washington into some idea of what real war is like. He said, the actual fact is that not one man in 20 in the government realizes what a grisly, tough, dirty business we are in. And what that brought to my mind with I must say, a certain uh, edge of anger is that Dick Cheney had five uh, deferments from serving. George Bush got as far as being in the Air Reserve, but never saw combat. Paul Wolferitz never got near uh, the uh, experience of being under fire wasn't in the military. And there was one other guy that was part of the foursome of the neoconservatives that, that started the uh, Iraq war. And uh, my sense is that, I mean, Eisenhower and some of the other top generals who knew really what war is are the most conservative about getting us involved in war. Because they know. They've been there. Um, and uh, another thing that Fussell shares, he says, in August 1944, a private wrote home to his gentle uh, civilized parents, quote, I cannot understand why you hope for a quick end of the war. Unless we take the horror of battle to Germany itself, unless we fight in their villages, blowing up their homes, smashing open their wine cellars, killing some of their livestock for food, unless we litter their streets with horrible, rotting German corpses, as was done in France. The Germans will prepare for war. 
unmindful of its horror. Defeat must be brought into Germany itself before this mess can come to a proper end. Um, I think he's right. I think he's right. And um, that's the thing that worries me about our country, that we don't carry the wounds, the imprint of that level of destruction in our own uh, psychology, in our own memory. Uh, the Germans and the French and the English are not eager to get into a war. Uh, now, some more about combat experience that I didn't realize until I was in the middle of fighting. You fight with your ears at least as much as with your eyes. Um, you learn very quickly to read when your um, artillery shells are going over your head towards the enemy and when artillery shells are coming in towards you and you can pretty well gauge how close they're going to come um, by the sound when you get trained to hear it. Uh, you can't do that with mortar shells because they are silent until they explode. So there, that's another story. Um, and there was <clears throat> one late afternoon, uh, probably in April, the war was winding down, but, and we were moving across Germany, but they had rear guard actions and they were setting up constantly, setting up surprise defenses. And our company was marching double file down a dirt road on a nice spring late afternoon and um, none of us suspecting that there was any uh, opposition in the neighborhood and the word suddenly got passed back um, hit, hit the ditches machine gun and our advanced scouts had heard the bolt being pulled back on the German machine gun. Uh, and the German machine guns we call Burke guns because they could shoot a thousand rounds a minute. Mm. Our machine guns could only shoot 500. Mm. It's like our Sherman tanks were no competition for the Panzer tanks. They're, they, but their tanks and their machine guns were so much better than ours, which was a little bit discouraging, I might add. Um, and um, so we hit, we hit the ditches, and sure enough, within 10, 15 seconds of us getting the word and just diving, we the whole, we all would have been wiped out. If those scouts hadn't heard, they didn't see, they heard. That. So you fight with, with your ears. And then we were involved in a, a fairly rare night fight, which is uh, really spooky because when it gets dark, the only way that anybody can tell who's shooting at whom is that you start using tracer bullets. So you got these tracer bullets flying back and forth. Um, and uh, we, we survived it and the Germans withdrew. My buddy, my closest buddy, <coughs> took off out of the ditch into the woods, little realizing that the Germans had us ambushed. They had 
they were dug in on the sides and in front. And um, he ended up in a foxhole with a German. <laughs> and uh, um, they looked at each other and they, uh, um, they both decided that they would simply stay there together and wait this one out. It was toward the end of the war and they saw no reason why either of them should die foolishly at this point. So they sort of made a compact. Uh, I don't know whether, I think it was probably nonverbal, but, uh, and they waited until the fighting was all over and then they crawled off in their appropriate directions. There's a wonderful story from the First World War uh, that I, you know, I think is so illustrative of part of how we overcome this incredible dynamism of projection and uh, destruction on the other. An American soldier found himself in some kind of a foxhole with a German soldier and the Germans were about to move out or in some way move on and they were ordered not to take any prisoners. So the German soldier raised his pistol and aimed it at the head of the American soldier and the American soldier leaned forward and looked him in the eye and said, Ich liebe dich. I love you. And the German soldier lowered his pistol. And these two men maintained knowledge of each other's whereabouts after the war and were in contact and they both went into vocations of human service. Uh, to me that's one of the redemptive stories of this um, dy dynamic. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I was most impressed by um, when Anita and I went to Washington, D.C., what, about three or four years ago? We had a Jungian conference down there, and so we decided, I hadn't been to Washington for ages, and uh, so we'd go and be tourists for two or three days. And of course, the first thing I wanted to go to was the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, I had, when I was in my training, in New York to be an analyst and also was uh, involved in a graduate program in psychiatry and religion at Union Seminary. It was when the Civil Rights Act was being fought uh, in the Congress in 64, I think it was. Uh, LBJ was president. And, you know, it was the Voting Rights Act and so much that had to do with a turning point in civil rights. and. There was a vigil held by uh, a rabbi, a Protestant clergy, and a Catholic priest. Hopefully we would now include a Muslim, at least, maybe a Buddhist. Uh, but we had this vigil in front of the Lincoln Memorial, 24 hours a day, day after day, for two months or more. That can use up a lot of clergy. So I volunteered to go down. I went down a couple of times. And um, uh, my first tour was from midnight to 4 in the morning. Uh, and standing there, you know, with the lighted image of Lincoln, uh, that was another deep experience for me, a little like the concentration camp guy. Um, and uh, uh, 
When Anita and I went back, the Korean War Memorial had been built. Now, we heard a lot about the Vietnam Memorial, which is beautiful and moving. I don't think the Second World War Memorial is all that impressive, but that's my judgment. But I saw the Korean War Memorial, and it is a squad of infantry on patrol. There are like 12 figures, all in appropriate garb with weapons, etc. And I don't know how the artist was able to capture this, but they're looking out, each is looking in a different direction. You see on their faces this concentration and level of anxiety. And they're listening. They're seeing, but they're listening. You know, like those scouts were. Um, and, you know, I was just dumbstruck. I said, this person who did this has captured the essence of what it's like to be on patrol in enemy territory. I've been there, and it was uh, it was really just very powerful for me. And there were a lot of vets there, and they were all. I went up and talked with them, and they were all feeling the same thing that something had been captured. I want to give an example of using your wits and savvy when you're in a combat situation. One day, probably in April or March, probably in April, I can't remember, we were on the edge of a town, I think, and we were going across an open area, and there was a great big rock in front of me, about 20, 30 yards, when a machine gun opened up from beyond the other side of this open space. And so I dashed and dove and got behind the rock and the machine gun bullets were going ding, 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 ding off this big rock, but they weren't hitting me. And I breathed a sigh of relief, temporary, I grant you, but at least I had made it. Then an artillery shell landed about 50 yards or so, 60 yards, in front of the rock. And then another artillery shell landed about 60 yards behind the rock. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist if you've been in combat. You know where the next shell is going to land. They've just bracketed you. It's going to land right on the rock. So that's what's called being between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> And I decided that I didn't want to be behind that rock. And about as far as maybe from here to the back of the room, which is probably about 15 to 20 yards, to my right was a stone building which would offer protection. And so when I saw that shell land behind, I had probably 15, 20, 25 seconds uh, before they loaded and fired the next one and recalibrated it. And what I didn't know is whether the machine gunner was still trained on the rock, but I decided I'd rather run for it than to stay there. So I got up and made an incredible dash, carrying all that equipment, and the machine gunner only saw me when I was two-thirds of the way there and swung his gun around. And, you know, it's like in the movies where the dirt flies up just behind your heels. And I made it to the uh, edge of the building and it was safe. And sure enough, as I looked around, a shell exploded right on the rock. Uh, now that's, those are the kind of choices and the use of your wits that is constantly going on. Uh, I mean, 
you got to be lucky. You can't be careful. But that doesn't mean you got to be dumb. I mean, you need to to uh, um, be aware of what the odds are. So um, that gives you uh, another war story from me. The next point I want to make is the psychological and ethical margin between life and death is very thin. Um, life becomes cheap rather than precious. That's not really quite fair because in some way it becomes more precious. But there's so much death around you, so much wounding, dismembering, that um, You know, as I said earlier, you cannot be careful, you can only be lucky. And so you're, you're living in a constant archetypal universe, in, a, in another alternate reality. Um, and um, how do you deal with this? Um, I asked the next question is, what is the psychic effect of killing other human beings, both enemy soldiers and civilians, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, where there is no visual distinction? I mean, German soldiers wore uniforms, and they carried weapons openly. Uh, and so, in being under attack, under fire, and in firing at others. I was so busy on the radio, thank God, that I don't, I don't know that I used my rifle very much ever at all, but I did direct artillery fire. And so I'm sure that I brought about the death of <coughs> Uh, a number of German soldiers when they were out in the open uh, and I called in artillery. Um, it's at enough of a distance so it's not quite so visually impactful. But the universal psychic phenomena of soldiers in combat is of numbing out any feeling, of splitting off the intense affect, of blocking off even the memory very often. And that, of course, is the roots of PTSD, that uh, the affect gets split off, which doesn't mean it goes away. It just goes underground, and it's like a smoldering under the, uh, the surface that can erupt at any moment with enormous intensity. Um, so healing requires the recovery of memory and of overwhelming affect. And that's very difficult. I mean, I described my experience relatively mild compared to what most combat veterans have to deal with. <coughs> Another major issue is combat becomes a rite of passage, an initiation into the status of manhood, or now, with the latest developments, of now womanhood women are allowed to be in combat. With the identity of being a warrior in a tribe, that is the military unit. Um, one man, I think it's Junger that I quoted earlier, men make war because war makes men. <laughs> 
it's the uh, uh, aphorism. And William James, uh, back around 1900, Varieties of Religious Experience, among other books that he wrote, raised the question, what is the moral equivalent of war? What alternative experience can we provide for our young men and young women, now more and more, that will initiate them into maturity, into a sense of having survived initiation tests and trials, it doesn't require killing each other in warfare. What is the moral equivalent of war? And so far we haven't found the answer. We just haven't found the answer. Um, now I'm going to um, talk a bit about the returning combat veteran, just to end this. Um, um, this is by a woman who is very knowledgeable about Navajo ritual and ceremony. And <clears throat> She writes, we have ceremonies and sacred rites for those killed in battle, but unlike the Navajo people, we lack needed rituals to contain the full impact of those surviving warriors. Collectively, we muse that they are the lucky ones returning without the visible scars of war. And in our yearning for a normality that would deny the darkest shadows of combat, we subtly, unconsciously expect the warrior to resume his or her pre-war pre -war persona as quickly as possible devoid of combat, loss, and brutality, he or she remembers all too well. That rings so true to me. And then she goes on and says, the trauma, I mean, she's talking about post-traumatic stress syndrome, post traumatic. She says, the trauma is combat and war itself. For many, the trauma is not post, not in the past, but a living presence that infuses waking and dreaming life. It lives as ongoing combat, rife with the archetypal energies of war, and the warrior, long after the departure, from the battlefield. <clears throat> she then writes, and boy do I agree with this one, calls to support our troops fail to delve below the surface. They indulge only superficial hero worship and misplaced sentimentality. By and large, people do not want to explore or meet the traumatized combat veteran where that combat veteran is still living. They want it to be over. They want it to be normal. They want to be as it was, and it will never be as it was. Over two million troops have been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. 20% of them come back with PSD after their first tour. Higher after their second and even their third tours. I read somewhere that those that were on three tours have a 40% level of PTSD. 
And then a final thing I, I read in the Globe Sunday magazine some weeks ago, some of you may have seen this, that they have now devised technologically a capacity to put up on a screen on a kind of, what am I trying to think of, surrounding screen, um, combat images. And they have a, you know, they can, they can create it according to what the veteran's experience was. So the veteran can describe the, com the traumatizing combat experience and they can recreate something comparable that surrounds him or her where in the in the room they're sitting in and draw him or her into re-experiencing that traumatic um, uh, encounter and what they've discovered is it's called prolonged exposure therapy. The repeated recall of traumatic events and processing the intense emotions that come up. Studies show that adding virtual reality to that process can help. Um, in a way, it's what happened to me on a minor scale compared to what most had to deal with, uh, when I went out to Esalen and that therapist drew me back into the living experiential reality of uh, my own war trauma. Okay, that's my story. And we got some time here for questions. Uh, so please, uh, yes. So I could make a lot of comments, but I'm desperate to find out if there is an answer to this question. During the war, we used atom bombs on two Japanese cities, firebombed many, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people died. In Germany, six million Germans died, more than three million civilians, almost three million in the military. Okay. Today they are among our most reliable allies. Okay. Why is it that the South is still back in the dark ages? <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I also remember um, and those terrible Sherman tanks. How many of those Southern kids had to go die in those tanks? Yeah, tanks. yeah, yeah. And I. You know, I was in the armored infantry, so when we attacked across open fields towards enemy positions, there would be about four infantrymen, infantrymen behind those tank turrets. I'd be on a tank turret holding on to handlebars there as the tanks went roaring across these open fields, you know, in a staggered line, shooting their tank guns, firing their machine guns, trying to keep the Germans pinned down so that we could get up close enough to them so then the infantry could jump off the tanks and uh, um, we could uh, attack uh, uh, their positions. And uh, a lot of those tanks just got blown out from under us. Um, and uh, so uh, it was one of the things that used to make us angry. Why the hell wasn't our technology as good as uh, the Germans in some areas. Now as for the South, um, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, I mean we still have so many secessionists now. Um, I, you know the thing that is interesting is slowly uh, the Hispanics are moving into southern States. Uh, the African Americans have got more and more voting rights and they're courageous in standing in line for 12 hours to cast a vote so that 
there is a slow progression, I do believe. But why they can't let go? Because uh, they lost. Yeah, and because there is a culture that they had which no longer really exists for the rest of the country that they cannot move beyond. They're stuck. There? Yeah. As a southerner, <laughs> <laughs> southerners had to continue to live with the enemy. That's a good point. Yes. But you and I are friends. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, I want to tell you that this is uh, extremely meaningful for people who've never experienced this, and I've heard bits of this before. And um, to thank you, to honor what you've been through. Thank you. Um, and then another thing I'd like to ask you about is people that uh, go back after years and years that have fought in wars like in Vietnam or Japan or wherever, they want to go back there, and I've seen this on TV, where they go back and they meet the people. These were places that they bombed and killed people, and they, it's an intensely emotional experience. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand it. I, I'm glad they do it, but why? what are they doing? What is that? They're repairing a terrible split, a terrible uh, wound in the collective psyche that affects us as individuals, that they dehumanize the enemy, as I pointed out. And now we rehumanize them as uh, potential friends and, and allies. You know, Anita uh, made a comment. We were, I'm a passionate Red Sox fan. And I assume I have many friends here with similar passions. And uh, uh, I think it was the last game of the World Series. And Koji Urahara came out to pitch in the ninth inning to shut it down. And Anita said, there, if you'd been in the Pacific and he had been your age, it had been your job to kill him. And Boston adores him. And so do you. How times change. It, to me, was a, a very insightful comment on what has shifted uh, with the Germans. I mean, one thing I'll, I'll share with you um, in 1948, I had finished my sophomore year at Amherst. I was 22 at that point. And I went back over to France to be in a uh, uh, summer uh, work program helping to uh, build, <coughs> build a school in the, the Huguenot section of France, uh, the Protestant section of France. And, uh, it's called a Collège Seveno, and it's in a town called Chambon sur Lignon, which actually hit, I believe, 3,000 Jews during the war, uh, and did it successfully. Uh, and they're all French Protestants. Um, and uh, the first lunch I had there, I was sitting opposite this blonde, blue-eyed, uh, smiling guy who was quite talkative, and I could tell he wasn't an American, but he spoke perfect English, and then he turned to somebody and speak perfect French, and, um, and he got up, he, he also spoke perfect German, and uh, his uncle, had been part of the plot against Hitler's life that was unsuccessful. He came out of Prussian nobility. His name, if I can remember all the words, Friedrich Werner Erich Rutger Graf von der Schulenberg. He was a German count. Uh, he was 
uh, maybe a year or two younger than me. Uh, and we figured out, he invited me up for coffee because we really connected. And I walked into his uh, room in the school and I saw the Cologne Cathedral on his wall. And I said, that's the Cologne Cathedral. He said, yeah, I know. I said, I fought down the main street of Cologne and captured that. He said, that's my hometown. And so began a friendship. And this guy was remarkable. So to make a long story short, I approached the dean of Amherst College because his education had stopped. But when he had to go into the service, and he, and yet he was extraordinarily intelligent. And I, I approached the dean. I said, as an act of reparation and recovery of friendship with the German nation, would you be interested in having a German uh, student come and study at Amherst, who was the enemy in the war? And the dean said. That's a great idea. I said, I have someone in mind. <laughs> and uh, he said, now, get his school records. I said, Dean, that's not going to work. <laughs> there are no school records. They all got bombed to, to smithereens. He said, get letters of recommendation. <laughs> so um, I went about spreading the word. I, I wrote to what well, we called him Fida. That was his nickname. I wrote to Fida, and I said, Fida, Get every letter of recommendation you can get hold of from important people and uh, have it sent to the dean of Amherst College. And about uh, two months later, I went into the dean's office and he said, Thayer, stop them, stop them. I've got 50 letters of recommendation. This guy walks on water. He's in. So then I went to the student uh, community chess fund, which had gone way over its goal, and I talked them into room board tuition. And then I wrote my fellow campers from the States and raised money for his passage. And uh, uh, that June I met, him, uh, I met him at the docks in New York, and he joined our family, and he really became my mother's third son. He became deeply a part of our family. I helped to marry him to a Virginia girl. And um, he went through Amherst in two years, magna cum laude. He then went to Harvard in the School of International uh, Economics and bombed it. Uh, when he was still a student, he was put on the German desk in Washington for the World Bank, I believe, or the International Monetary, International Monetary Fund. And uh, anyway, I won't talk more about him, but that was my reconciliation action uh, and couldn't have been better. Yeah? Thank you for that very personal story. And as a person who's been a healer for 30 years, I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing with veterans over time getting worse and worse as they're coming back with less and less services that deal with shame and guilt, particularly. From your union community, could you talk about public policy that might be helpful if you could have your dreams on how to actually help these veterans with these PTSD issues for shame and guilt, particularly? You pick the two words that I think most accurately describe what's at the root of uh, the pain of most returning veterans. Um, that's a very challenging and, and very fair question. Um, what we're running up against, as I tried to say, is that Americans want returning veterans to be normal. And they're not normal. Uh, and uh, they deeply need, you know, I think um, I've, I've worked with a few um, veterans, 
with PTSD, and um, I think I've been helpful, but I don't think my form of therapy is necessarily the best one. The, the, the things that's most helpful are the dreams. Jungians work with dreams a great deal, and uh, inevitably the, the shame and the guilt and the horror come up in their dreams. And that is a way of helping them to release affect. But there, there is not the financial resources, the government. I mean, look at how long it takes just to get, what is it, disability? or to get attention from the uh, Veterans Department. Uh, it's outrageous. It's criminal. We send these young men and women over, and they can't know what they're going to have to deal with. And when they come back, uh, we, don't, we don't heal them in that long, slow process. I wish I had a real answer. Yeah. Um, my first supervisor, Harry Wilmer. Yeah, Harry. Yeah. He worked with veterans. A lot. A lot. He worked. And he worked a lot. What he, what he discovered in... Work, Turn around. Yeah. Here. He, what he discovered in working with veterans with their dreams is that he did not work with them as, as a normal dream, but they were... A, they were uh, traumatized dreams, tra dreams of trauma. And so he would just listen to them and let them, because they would have recurring dreams every night, horrifying dreams. And he would just sit with them going through the experience in their dreams of the trauma. And he would, he would watch the dreams slowly, very slowly change as the person kept going through the trauma, through the trauma, through the trauma. And um, I work a lot with women who have PTSD. And I, I think it's the same process. You have to go into the body and the emotion, and you have to go through it, which takes a lot of courage. So, um, and, and I just wanted, can I just say one more thing about, um, you were talking about what replaces war in initiation. And I think that's what we've lost, because there used to be initiations into adulthood, and we have none of that in our culture. So. And we have to stop in a minute. So. Let me say that we do have uh, initiation still. Drugs, <laughs> sex, driving cars fast, drunk. Um, Bar mitzvahs. What? Bar mitzvahs. Bar mitzvahs. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Tattoos. Uh, tattoos, that's a good tattoos. one. Walkabouts. Walkabout. Football. Sports. Sports. Sports, yeah, sports is a major one. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, about a year ago I was watching some sort of a movie called Gladiators. And it was really essentially against the enforcers in hockey who are charged with yeah. protecting the key players on the hockey team. And they concentrate on one guy in my hockey team, so I don't remember his name. Um, but the hardest thing for him after he finished was he had had a sense of giving, a sense of importance, a sense of uh, almost an altruistic sense of protecting his teammates, and that gave him supreme meaning to his life. And then about four or five years ago when they were doing the Band of Brothers and then the Pacific Experience, they had some interviews of veterans, and they would kind of relate that they, there had never been for them, aside from the adrenaline, a sense of closeness to others and to men than they had been in the combat situation. So I, I kind of wonder if there's a psychologist, he's a Jungian psychologist out of Houston. I've read a few of his books. I don't know if anybody can name him. Like James that. Yes, James Ellis. And he talks about men's psyche and um, the, the, their lack of, of attachment to um, maybe their animus or their feminine side, and that they have to make these, um, it's only through these somewhat um, dysfunctional 
states of experience that they seem to be able to you know, come out of themselves and be able to relate on a meaningful level with men and maybe women as a result. Any comments? Uh, yeah, I, I, we got to stop. Uh, I, I think you've made a good point. Male eros is the way I describe it. In other words, the way in which under those circumstances, if you watch the Red Sox after the final pitch, all dash towards the center of the mound, embrace each other, pile on each other, uh, kiss each other, um, that, that, uh, uh, that happens in a, in a, uh, the context of combat and war, that you are really so bonded to uh, some guy who's just pushed you down a moment before bullets were going to go flying over your head. I think it yeah. suggests, as you started your talk tonight, about you know the, the perpetuation of war, that we have so few interruptions of. What that suggests to me is the addiction. The addiction to is war. The addiction, I said it while well, Sebastian Unger, when he talked, we yeah. saw him talk at, at, uh, at so Wellfleet. It was the same question I asked. You know, is really the, you know, the kind of rush and the bonding and that, you know, extreme experience for men and whether, whether the war making and being a warrior and having that experience as an initiation into manhood, you know, that, that's really a problem. Oh, and it's a big problem. There is a very interesting book, and with this I will stop. Um, James Hillman, Jim Hillman, who passed away about a year or two ago, um, wrote many books. One of his books is really very challenging. It's entitled, The Terrible Love of War. And um, it, it really lays out the mythic um, aspects of war, the um, archetypal magnet, the draw that it has. And Junger makes that point, 20 minutes uh, behind a machine gun may be the most exciting 20 minutes of his life. Uh, and what does that do to people, you see? So, yeah.